is our eighth and final one of these sessions and um, they've all been fantastic and I think um, those of us that have been to all of them have got lots of ideas and tips out of them. Um, there's something new and different that comes out of each one. So thank you for joining us today. Today is really an opportunity for us to talk about um, the specialisation verification framework and in particular specialisation in regards to working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We'll talk a little bit about um, where the framework has come from, um, some of the benefits and how it might be able to support you in your practice, um, the process for applying for verification, what that looks like. But um, without fail, the best part of all of these um, workshops has been the opportunity to talk to some experts in the space. So um, I'm very excited to welcome Mark Williams from Marlon Marlon here today. My name's Mark Williams. I'm the Planned Activities Group Social Support Coordinator here at Marlon. I work very closely with um, our elders. We also have a little catering business called Marlon, uh, Marlon Creations. So we provide uh, Indigenous cuisine, currently managing a project called Safe Strong Elders which is addressing um, elder abuse in the um, eastern metropolitan region. My name is Bev Murray. I'm the program manager at Link Up Victoria, which is a program of the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency, a statewide Aboriginal community organisation. And our service is all about supporting the stolen generations who reside here in Victoria. We provide, we provide um, research around connections. We provide reunions. We're the only service that is funded. To do reunions, we do reunions all over Australia, from the smallest remote communities to big cities. We produce resources, uh, organise events to commemorate days of significance to the stolen generations. We're very um, grateful that you're here today to share your experience and vast knowledge. I also just want to acknowledge that um, all communities are different, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And so we are in no way, shape or form um, talking about working with one group of homogenous people who are all the same. So I just want to put that sort of up front. It's quite diverse. Yeah. And um, and I think that's um, I think that's quite attractive when you when you're working in the space of working with older or elder people. Today's um, a you know a short workshop. I also just want to really put on the table up front that this is not in-depth diversity training where we have an opportunity to really understand the kind of nuanced experience of um, individuals or communities. Um, I hope what everyone will get out of our conversation today is some really practical ideas around um, better understanding the specialisation verification framework. Um, whether you're ready to pursue verification or not, I think it's really valuable to understand the framework and how it might be able to support you in your quality improvement. But also some practical ideas about um, how we can support um, our teams and communities in delivering safe and inclusive services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So um, it's going to be very big picture. Um, and then, as Mark was saying, there is so much diversity in every community. I think um, the more that I have worked in this space around um, diversity and person-centred practice, two things always really stand out to me. And the first one is leave your assumptions at the door. Um, and the second one is as soon as you start thinking, here's how this group of people need services delivered, you're on the wrong track. Um, what you want to be able to do is set your service up to be inclusive for as many people as possible. And um, if you take the starting point that um, older people are an incredibly diverse group of people, um, as is the rest of the community, but the fact is older people have been here longer. So um, they are most likely to have experienced more and different and a whole lot of different things. So it's actually likely that they're probably our most diverse community. Um, so as soon as we start thinking older people, this, that or the other, I would try and check that assu assumption first. Um, hopefully what we can get better at is asking better questions and being prepared to um, support and embrace that diversity, I guess, as organisations and teams.
let's launch in and just have a look firstly at um, where the specialization verification framework has come from and a bit of the background around that. Most importantly, um, embedded within our act, our quality standards um, and a whole lot of um, program guidelines, et cetera, that sit around that. We all have a responsibility to deliver care that is safe and inclusive for all older people. And when we're thinking about all older people, it's not just the diversity that you can see and count within your existing group of consumers. It is the diversity within your community. So that might be um, older people that don't know about your service yet, older people that um, require your service but haven't been able to access it, older people that used your services in the past and stopped for whatever reason, um, and everybody around them. So it's really important when you're thinking about um, those responsibilities to put up front that it's your entire community that we're thinking about, not just the diversity you can see. A lot of work has obviously been happening in the aged care space. We are still right in the middle of very major reforms, um, particularly around the support at home program. That reform will continue to roll out over a number of years. And one of the things that is becoming um, more and more prominent throughout um, the updates to things like the Act and the quality standards one of the key learnings from the Royal Commission is that we really need to get better at responding to the diversity in our community and really setting ourselves up to be equipped to support all people in our community. The specialisation verification framework um, has been developed in response to Recommendation 30 of the Royal Commission um, and it really talked about our need to move away from organisations um, deciding that they were equipped to needing to be able to provide more objective evidence to say we are actually set up and capable of providing safe and inclusive services for our community and here's how we can demonstrate that work. So within the Aged Care Act, I'm sure people are very familiar with the fact that there are nine special needs groups identified. Um, I also just feel like it's important to acknowledge that the language special needs groups is probably not um, inclusion 101 um, and it certainly looks like um, the language of special needs groups um, might be taken out of the next um, version of our Aged Care Act. What the Act identifies is that for many different reasons um, there are some people in our community who might face additional cha challenges or barriers being able to successfully navigate our aged care system, access services that are right for them and use services that are actually going to give them the best possible outcomes. And that's where these special needs groups have come from. Again, these are not nine different and mutually exclusive groups of people. Um, it's really just about recognising the additional barriers. Many um, people who identify with some of these diversity characteristics have experienced really significant discrimination and oppression. Um, they may have experienced significant trauma um, and that can create a number of barriers along the way as well. So the other thing that we see very strongly coming through in um, the Royal Commission, revision of the quality standards, is the need for us to be thinking and more prepared to be delivering that healing aware and trauma informed care in our communities. The specialisation verification framework has been set up as a tool to be able to ensure that um, aged care providers can demonstrate the work that you're doing in order to be equipped to deliver services to people who identify with any or all of these special needs groups. Every organisation, as I said, needs to be able to demonstrate as part of your quality improvement program um, and through our aged care quality standards and quality reviews that you are equipped to deliver safe and inclusive care for all older people, including people who identify with the different diversity characteristics. The verification framework has been introduced as an additional optional step 
for organisations. And it's really about being able to demonstrate that you're going above and beyond those standards um, and providing de dedicated focus and effort to deliver that um, specialised care that's going to meet the unique needs of individuals. The framework was set up um, by AHA through consultation with a whole lot of experts in the space. Consumers have been involved in the development and service providers as well. Um, and in 2022, uh, they started um, reviewing applications. The framework includes specific criteria for each of the special needs groups that you need to be able to provide evidence against. Um, and there's also a process where they will collect feedback from um, local service users to be able to understand their experience of inclusion with your organisation. One of the key things, I guess, um, to think about is that you might be in a place now where you are pursuing um, verification, but even if you're not in that space yet, I think there are some really good benefits of understanding um, the verification framework as well. Certainly, it's a really good way for all organisations to um, have some good practical ideas about what does it take to deliver safe and inclusive services? How can you as an organisation be working towards inclusion? Um, and you might use the criteria, which we'll talk about in a minute, to be able to provide guidance in that direction. If you do pursue um, verification, it's also a way that you can demonstrate to your community that you are actively involved, focusing and um, on inclusion and equipped to be able to work with people. It certainly might be a way that you can promote your point of difference and um, include it in your messaging to your community about your service and the work that you're doing. Most importantly though, what specialisation verification does is that it sets up a system where older people and the people around them can more confidently make decisions about which service is going to be a good fit for them. It enables people to make choices and collect information and know that that's, you know, objectively measured so that um, they can make good decisions about who they want to work with. Um, and it also can be really useful for assessors and other people in the community to be able to make appropriate referrals to organisations to support older people in our community. One of the big differences, and I guess the key difference um, outwardly around being verified is that the way that that information is um, shown on the finder provider tool. So via my age care, um, you can go online and you can look for a provider. You can filter your search in a whole lot of different ways. And one of the filters is looking at specialised care. So here, what I've done is selected a local area that I want to provide, uh, find a provider in, and I've chosen Portland and I'm looking for CHSP services and I chose a few different um, services. And then you can go and um, under this tab for specialised care, you can pick which of the special needs groups you want to be looking for. And what that does is allow you to filter via providers that have achieved specialisation verification. It's important to note that specialisation verification only applies to this first um, tab around specialised care. There are other ways that you can um, filter your search. For example, you might want a provider that delivers services in a specific language or to people who identify with a particular faith. Might be things like working with people with dementia specifically. Those are all still um, specialisations that organisations will nominate themselves. So specialisation verification only applies to um, the nine special needs groups identified in the Act. Yeah, I've chosen that I want to find providers who are verified to work with Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples. And you can see that when you look in the search, there are 32 different providers in my local area. And um, here you'll see that um, uh, Dewerderong is the provider that meets the criteria in terms of being able to deliver that specialised service. When you actually have a look at the provider information, information comes up about the specialisations that each service has provided. So again, here we're looking at Dewerderong um, and you can see that they're specialised, they've achieved verification 
for both working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and also people living in rural and remote areas here in Portland in Victoria. And then you can actually go in and have a look at which services in particular, the specialisation applies to and the criteria that the organisation met to be able to achieve verification. So the whole community has access to that information to be actually to be able to look into the detail behind the verification that organisations have achieved. Certainly some of the feedback that we've had um, from older people in a range of different um, communities has been knowing that you can go and search for providers that are verified really makes people feel a lot more confident um, in being able to make a referral and work with an organisation that may understand their experience. Some of the other feedback that's come along with that is that when people have searched for verified providers in their local community and haven't found any, it has created some anxiety that potentially no one's equipped to be able to um, support that person and might understand their experience, which is certainly not necessarily true, but just worthwhile to really keep that in mind that since this has been introduced, um, you want to make sure that um, there's some messaging, I guess, around what might happen. And I know um, a, a, some, a couple of providers have mentioned that they've done a lot of work with consumers to then find alternative um, providers because there hasn't been anyone verified in someone's local area. So it's just something to keep in mind. assured that there are lots of resources to back you up and walk you through the steps of this process. Certainly the aged care provider guidance manual would be a really good place to start, um, but there are a number of resources online that go into more detail around this. Essentially though, what you need to do is complete um, a specialisation evidence form. We'll ask you which criteria um, you believe your organisation can meet, and then you upload the evidence along with that um, also and then that process is all online when you are um, applying for verification it doesn't need to be your entire organization you might select specific services or programs or sites um, that it's relevant to it's not an all-in approach so just be aware of that you might have um, some programs that you think have really been doing a lot of work in a space that work can be acknowledged and verified um, because it can apply to specific services. AHA will then assess your application and it usually takes around um, four weeks, the process. As I said earlier, there is a process where they will collect feedback um, from service users and they're really looking at are those people that are working with your organisation able to provide feedback that you are providing inclusive and appropriate care that meets people's needs. While we're here, one of the um, questions that we've had a few times in terms of verification is um, how do we identify um, people using our services that might identify with any of the diversity characteristics without singling people out? We also know that um, being inclusive is not dependent on disclosure. So you absolutely do not want to be in a position where you are forcing people to identify parts of their identity that might, they might not be comfortable with. So then how would you identify um, people who might be able to provide feedback? So just a little aside um, hint here would be um, it's really helpful when you're looking for um, recipients to provide feedback make that message open to everyone and invite everyone to um, participate and then they can self-nominate. So if you were looking for people perhaps that um, identify as LGBTI um, in the LGBTI communities, then you could invite everybody and say, if this is relevant to you, you're very welcome to um, provide feedback. We'd love to hear from you. This is the space we're working in, et cetera. Even if um, your LGBTI elders choose not to participate in that process, 
it's another really good way to continue to reiterate your work in this space and your commitment to inclusion of all communities. So um, just something to keep in mind, perhaps if you get to that step and it feels like a stumbling block. You will, of course, after you submit your application, be notified of the outcome. Um, and once you've achieved verification, then um, that will be displayed on the finer provider tool as we looked at before. In your resource list um, for today's session, you'll also find all of those resources to back you up and all of that where you find all the evidence forms, et cetera, in there as well. It doesn't need to be an overly onerous process um, or a huge amount of work to apply for verification. And certainly I hope that it won't be something where you're starting from scratch. It's really about bringing together the evidence of all the work you're already doing. Um, and I'm sure when we look at the criteria, you might find that a number of these um, are already things that are relevant to you. So up on the screen now, we have the criteria that apply specifically for um, verification for working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And you'll see that there are two tiers of criteria. So for the tier one criteria, you only need to meet one of these criteria. So um, if you are an ACO, then you, you can just provide evidence that you are um, an ACO and that will automatically provide you with tier one um, verification. If you provide home care programs or residential aged care, um, NATS EFAC providers are also, um, that's another tier one criteria, but for CHSC, CHSP providers, um, it'll be our local ACOs. Then there are a number of um, criteria that are tier two criteria. And when you're applying for verification, if you're not an ACO, you need to be able to provide evidence that you meet four of these criteria. I've got sort of a summary of those criteria here. And they are things like at least 50% of the people using your services identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, that you're getting feedback, as we've mentioned before, that demonstrates that you're providing um, services that are appropriate and meet the needs of um, your Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, consumers, that you have um, staff employed in your organisation who identify as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islanders, um, and that they're supported to be champions working in your in working in this space that at least 90 percent of staff have completed um, relevant training and here it's both around delivering culturally safe services to aboriginal and torres strait islander peoples and also um, making sure that the training includes a focus on trauma-informed care as well that you've got um, strong links and ongoing connections and engagement with local community organisations, leaders, whatever that looks like um, in your local area, that you're participating and providing opportunities to engage in local celebrations, cultural events. Um, you may have services that are delivered in your local Indigenous languages. You might deliver services in partnership with local Aboriginal organisations. Also, then there are broader organisational things such as um, having an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person represented on your board and having an active um, uh, advisory group focusing on and, and working with and um, involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I think that if you think about um, each of these things individually, you would say none of these things are unique to specialisation verification. I think that those are reasonable indicators in many ways of what we would be hoping all organisations are doing as part of their quality improvement. So there might be a number of these that you are already engaged with. We're also going through this process we were trying to look at our profile so Mullum as a profile and the services that we provide and as we moved and moved towards the likes of this my aged care space and we're talking referrals and and obviously the services that we provide for our community it was these are a number of things that I think we've already ticked in the box I think the other thing with these criteria is you'll see that a number of them are fairly broad. 
Um, again, one of the questions that we've been asked a few times is about what does relevant training look like in this space? And there aren't really specific um, criteria around training other than the fact that it's not a tick and flick process. Um, so it's ongoing, at least annual training. And I think that um, most people would agree that that's best practice. Um, and what that looks like is obviously going to be different depending on the scope of your services and your organisation and your communities. So there is um, space in many of these criteria that look fairly broad for you to be able to demonstrate why the training that you're doing is appropriate for your local community, for example. Let's look a little bit more broadly about who our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are. Um, I mentioned right at the beginning that um, we're certainly not talking about one group of people who all um, are the same. Enormous diversity in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, both locally and individually and across the nation. However, we absolutely know that the, our first peoples in this country have experienced really systematic ongoing marginalisation. I'm sure um, people are very familiar with the gap in health outcomes and life expectancy and things like that. And therefore, because of that, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are eligible to access aged care services from the age of 50 rather than 65 or 45 if they're also experiencing significant disadvantage or risk of homelessness as well. So um, even if you just use that as a very simple sort of starting point, the profile of um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that who are accessing aged care might be very different than um, the profiles of other older people accessing aged care services. So um, you know, right from that initial point of access, we need to be thinking about how we can support people in an inclusive way. I think it's also really important to recognise that everybody has a different understanding of what health and wellbeing means to them, but certainly um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are an excellent example of where there is that cultural overlay to the understanding of health and wellbeing. That for many um, Aboriginal elders, for example, there is much less of an individual sense of health and that good health and well-being um, really is a very holistic concept and might be very strongly linked for some people to country, community, um, culture, those kind of things. The other thing I just want to acknowledge before we get too far into this, that um, the terminology around working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples is very different in different communities. There is no single agreed language or terms that are used by all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, I completed a project recently and the very first thing that they asked me to do was a glossary. And uh, after a year and a half, um, the very last thing that we never did was a glossary, um, primarily because the language in this space is not um, singular and agreed. Um, when I was working with the Indigenous health team at the Department of Health and Aged Care, um, even within that team, there were really different preferences around using the words Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, Indigenous people um, and First Nations peoples. So um, uh, even within that one team. So the idea that there would be one term that everybody agrees to, um, certainly what I've learned is that's perhaps not going to happen or isn't happening right now. Um, individually, absolutely, the golden rule is ask the person how they identify and use that language. Um, more broadly, though, it is really helpful to know in your local community um, whether there is preferred language and terminology. Um, and, Mark, I just wanted to ask you there if you have any thoughts around that kind of language piece, but also um, that cultural understanding of health and wellbeing that is a good starting point for us. What we've found over the many years of Mullum is that, um, you know, we've got our some of our elders that are from different um, country, from uh, different states and territories. And so you do naturally have that uh, distinct and different um, uh, language, um, terminology, and the dot points here, absolutely. Um, very true, you know, particularly like, yeah, the concepts of health and wellbeing, 
where they come from and the things they've experienced in their life and their journey, but uh, when they engage with us. So there's a lot in there. I'm very aware that these are simple um, bullet points to describe very complex and, you know, an enormous amount of history behind those. So um, I don't want to be oversimplifying people's experience with bullet points in any way, shape or form. I guess really the thing is that this is baseline, that we all need to understand more about these bullet points to be able to have any chance of then moving towards um, inclusive service delivery. Um, one of the pieces of feedback I hear a lot in my work is the idea of we treat everybody the same. Wouldn't matter to me if somebody identified as Aboriginal or not, I'll treat them the same. And while I think that comes from a place of respect and um, hopefully kindness and, you know, what that person wants is an idea of um, fairness, the idea of treating everybody the same is really the opposite of inclusion for lots of people that um, really treating everybody respectfully is about us having done our work to understand people's stories and who they are and what they need from us. And as an organisation, us being able to set up our services to be able to work with people in really different ways. If, for example, um, we think about an Aboriginal person's experience of maybe being separated from their family and the organisations that were involved in that over time and over their lifetime, um, it's very reasonable to assume then that that person may not feel comfortable working with mainstream organisations and may have more questions and need more time or information presented in a different way to feel really confident about signing pieces of paper that, you know, other people might not give a second thought to. That it might be really confronting and triggering for many people to be requiring support from um, different services. Bev, I was wondering if you might be able to speak to um, some of the challenges that people might experience in terms of going back to work with institutions and services and know that a service is going to be safe and appropriate and inclusive for them. For us, it's about making sure that we that we are acknowledged as Aboriginal people, that our culture is respected, that we can feel safe within a within a within an aged care facility that can do some, you know, very simple things from having Aboriginal artwork to, to, to making sure that they get Aboriginal, you know, service services involved in um, providing ongoing services for any mob that's there. So it's a whole range of things that they can do to make sure that, you know, our mob feel respected and feel comfortable within their service. Yeah, really important for us because you know, our experience, Steingenic's experience was was about denying our identity as Aboriginal people, yeah? It was about um, making sure that our connections, our culture, that, that that was lost, you know? So we need to make sure that our mob feel that that's not going to happen again. They are included, they are respected, and they are acknowledged. Yes, that makes perfect sense. Thank you, Bev people's idea of what they're aiming for and knowing that their cultural beliefs around perhaps death and dying might be really different, whether they'll be respected. We need to have done our homework to be able to at least come prepared to those conversations. So these are very big things. Um, Mark, I was just wondering, with that idea of um, different kind of cultural concepts of health and wellbeing, is there a really um, sort of simple way that you might um, be able to summarise that maybe cultural concept of health and wellbeing for many Aboriginal people? The one thing that we do try to concentrate is when we talk of about the spiritual and social and emotional wellbeing is that we're, it's about also getting back on country. So that just might be where it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple activity of maybe getting out, um, out on country to a significant place, I suppose. We're here out in the eastern metro region, so we've got, there's some historical uh, places that we've got in the likes of Corrindirk, you know. So, you know, and uh, with Simon Wonga and Wonga Park and the historic, the history of Hillsville. So we, the, just that alone, I think, um, having a smoking ceremony, getting back on country um, is, is something that 
it, it's quite universal, I think, for for all of our mobs. So um, that one of those, just just that activity alone, um, seems to have this uncanny ability to engage and connect our community with with our service services. I guess just understanding the importance of whether it be a specific ceremony like a smoking ceremony um, or being able to facilitate connections either in your own organisation or through local partners um, would be a really good starting point for people. I think the concept of social and emotional wellbeing, there are lots of resources out there. It's certainly something that um, would be really valuable for lots of staff to have access to more information. So, um, you know, places like WellMob, for example, have some really good resources, but we'll include a couple of starting points in your um, resource list for today if that's something that you want to go and have a look into. If we look at what safe and inclusive services look like for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I've got here some really big buzzwords that we see continue to pop up in pretty much all publications. We'll see we are required to, as part of our standards, deliver culturally safe care. One of the things that came through very strongly through the Royal Commission recommendations, and again, we're seeing more and more in the revised quality standards, so work around um, becoming better equipped to deliver um, trauma-aware and healing-informed, or you might say it as trauma-informed care, that we're working to enable people and empower our clients. Those concepts around self-determination are identified as being really important for many Aboriginal people and that we need to be equipped to deliver care that is holistic. And I think that that would be a hard list for anybody to disagree with. But I also think those are really big concepts to actually understand how you do that. So um, I wanna just have a little bit more of a look at some of those things. And I've got some key points up here. So, um, a really important starting point, and I wonder if, um, Mark, this kind of builds nicely on what you were talking about before. It's one thing to be a service provider in your local community. It's another thing to be um, working hard to be inclusive of your local Aboriginal community. But then being able to get that message out, whether it's via find a provider or whether it's by, via other community channels, is just as important Everybody needs to do some work to actually understand who your um, local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are and how you build connections with those. Would you, is that fair, Mark, like in your work with your clients, but even connections with other mainstream organisations? That's right. This is pretty close. And that we also engage with other um, other community groups and, and uh, get involved with other community organisations and, and um, you know, and support and, and 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 get involved. So, you know, and that starts obviously from the organisation, and we build the, you know, we we bring the community along to to get involved and, you know, create that um, level of rapport. You know, understanding um, the local community groups. Um, so, there's a. The service that we provide is like within the pet, the PAG group. That's that that's one part of it, but it's what we do outside of it. So it's getting involved with the I don't know the seniors wellbeing expo at Karalika. Um, it's getting involved with the likes of the Canara houses and the other neighbourhood houses. Um, you know the role that we play as an organisation um, goes far and wide to establishing great rapports and getting involved with other community groups it's it, so I, I it's a it's a work in progress you build it they will come mentality but it's also you understanding your own community that you're working i guess what really stands out to me for other like mainstream organizations as well is that um sometimes Many smaller orgs and ACAs are an excellent example of that where you become, well, try your very best to become everything to your clients and you actually can't be everything and everyone to um, each of the elders that you're working with. Um, making sure and maintaining those relationships with, for example, the you know Eastern Health Aboriginal Health Team or um, other local providers 
really facilitating those links and building those relationships in advance has enormous benefit for everybody involved. But I think sometimes what can happen, um, particularly with ACOs, is that people will just go to the organisation when they need something. For the mainstream services, I'd really be thinking about what are you bringing to the table? Like that, those links with your local organisations are incredibly valuable for you. Um, so, you know, is there an opportunity for you to go along to your local elders PAG, for example, or a social support program and join in, let people know who you are, let people know what you do, you know, that idea of building trust and rapport, you see that on every single um, piece of good practice information, particularly around working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. But that takes work and often that work is before you even get to building trust with an individual as a service provider. It's all of those connections beforehand. So, yeah. I hope that that goes both ways. Building a great rapport, you're building a relationship and you're building a partnership because you want that to have a bit of a lifespan to it as well, you know. So, um, you know, job sh the job sharing of it of sorts and who does what. And it also comes back to a little bit of about Mullum and you mentioned of about the size of Mullum. You know, we, we, we're a small team. We have um a few programs but our reach is far and wide our highlights reel um if you could imagine is um yeah pretty unique pretty special so and but again that's taken a long time but other people in the room and um other mainstream providers thinking about the power of that community connection and presence in your community is really what enables that to happen and um thinking about how as a mainstream provider people can add value, there are huge reciprocal benefits for you and most importantly, your elders. We are all here because we're committed to delivering the best possible services we can to our community and um, really making strong connections. The other thing that um, we know is really important, there's lots of evidence, there's lots of guidelines about is the importance of, you know, as part of your intake assessment, getting to know people kind of processes, um, learning about what people's um, beliefs and um, cultural needs are is an important part of that. I guess we need to be really clear that no one's going to be an expert in anybody else's cultural beliefs or values, um, but having a workforce that's equipped to ask the right questions and understand what's important to people and then, um, you know, what that might look like isn't a lot of extra work and effort, doesn't require a huge amount of tick boxes on a form. It's just about making sure that we ask the right questions and do something with that information. One of my big bugbears, which is um, I'm having a lot of conversations about at the moment, is we know that every organisation is required to have um, a question on your paperwork that asks someone if they identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. What happens is that so many organisations tick that box and then never do anything with that information. They've just ticked it as an admin data collection, you know, point, and then nothing else happens from there. And that is such a lost opportunity. What we should be doing is that if someone does identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, um, it doesn't mean we know what to do, but it should absolutely shape what we do next in terms of, I hope that we would know to ask some questions and perhaps think about how we might approach someone's assessment differently, um, how we might match workers differently. So might be, for example, um, it, it may or may not be appropriate for me to go out and visit an older Aboriginal man by myself. Some people, that might not be a problem at all. Others, that would be really culturally inappropriate. We should know enough as staff that if someone's ticked that box, it should be a red flag that at least I ask that question. At least that we ask whether there's anything somebody needs to um, feel confident. Maybe they'd like to involve an advocate or um, a team member from a local um, gathering place or whatever that might look like for them. If we tick that box and then never think about that again and then someone has to, you know, um, um, bring up that information in a completely separate and different way, no one's winning that um, conversation. 
Historically, um, there were lots of challenges in terms of compliance with people filling in those questions on the form. Um, I just want to let, remind you as well that there are some really great resources out there, really simple sort of one pages, really short videos that talk about why we ask the question around whether people identify um, as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, how to have those conversations respectfully, what we do with that information. So we'll include those in your resource list as well. Mark, is there anything else that you wanted to add there? The more that you engage with your community, the better you understand them for their needs and what they require and how you build that into your service delivery and then overall as an organisation. The key is that those are really big concepts. And as organisations, what we all need to be able to do is think about how you take those really big com concepts and then demonstrate that you are equipped and capable and delivering services in line with those big concepts. And it's um, not enough, I guess, just to um, have written down in a policy and procedure that you're holistic or that you are strengths-based or you understand social and emotional wellbeing, for example. Um, you need to then look at how do you support your staff to work and actually implement those practices. So um, are your policies and procedures supportive? Have you got the right tools that allow you to ask the right questions and have those conversations? Um, do you have community connections? Do you have ways that staff can build their understanding of your local community and um, equip themselves to feel confident to have those conversations with people and, you know, know what to do with that information? If connection to country, as Mark was saying, is really important to someone. Do you know what to do with that? And you don't have to be the expert, but hopefully you'll know enough to be able to ask the person and link in with experts in your local community to be able to facilitate that and empower the people to get the support that they need. I understand that um, not everybody will be able to access services from an Aboriginal service. So maybe for a mainstream service, what might someone look for? It's about going to a service and seeing that us as a people, as a people with the culture, how that is respected, having the Aboriginal flag, the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander flag is fine. Yeah. That's, and you know, as soon as you see that on any service, we feel welcome straight away. Yeah. And then going inside and seeing Aboriginal people represented through their art or photographs with staff, having Aboriginal staff having staff who have undergone cultural awareness training because um, you can pick that up straight away too when you start talking to people. I think being um, listened to about, you know, what your needs are. No point having a plan if you're not going to be listened to, yeah, and if what you're saying isn't going to be acted upon. Yes, so deliver, actually follow through. Yeah. Um, and as I said too, uh, about having um, Aboriginal community members, workers visiting, yeah, to talk to, to our mob and to provide ongoing service for them, having speakers, having Aboriginal entertainment. So it's all sorts of things, you know, from, from commemorating NAIDOC week and other Aboriginal days you know, in the facility, because that's good for everyone. And these are things that are good for everyone. You know, we know that, that um, you know, the things that we've asked for, they've translated over to other people, you know, and, and made, it, made it a better life for them. Almost like magic. You actually spoke um, really beautiful, beautifully to many of the points that are actually criteria to be able to demonstrate um, evidence for the specialisation verification framework in terms of the environments, um, having Aboriginal staff, you know, supported as champions, um, remaining connected to community organisations all of um, the physical environment, all of those things are the kind of things that providers can use as evidence as well. Can I also mention how um, um, having that connection to family, that is just so important for Stolen Generation Small, particularly. I'll give you an example of, um, of a, you know, we organise a reunion for, for four um, elders. That um, One of them lived in Victoria, one of them lived in New South Wales, and one of them lived in remote New South Wales. So we thought, well, we want to do something for them because they're elderly. Two of them had serious health issues. They were never going to, you know, we were never going to be able to get them all together back home here on country. So we organised a Zoom, 
a Zoom reunion. We've never done that before, but we thought it was just so critical that we did something for this family, yeah? So we were very grateful for the support that we received from the elder who was in a aged care facility. You know, the, the nurse there, she just went above and beyond in supporting our client, you know, our client to participate in this reunion on Zoom. So things like that, you know, yeah. that's what we'd like to see. That reminds me as well of the importance of understanding how different everybody's um, understanding about what health and wellbeing means to them is. Mm. And I know that um, in many Aboriginal communities, there's much more of that community focus yep. on health and wellbeing that rather than an individual focus, which might be more of a Western kind of um, approach. But, yep. you know, understanding that as a starting point is really key to being able to deliver care that's actually going to work for someone yet. It's about looking after everybody, isn't yeah. it, in the end? Yeah. Thank you, Bev. I wonder if you have, you know, one tip or idea about um, when your elders need to work with other mainstream services, what's something that those services could do to show that they are inclusive and equipped to be working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? That you're making it culturally safe by the sheer fact that you're acknowledging the, the you know, the country, the, you know, the traditional uh, group that uh, the service provider might be based in and the worker and, you know, that, that, that they, that they're au fait. They have um, some cultural understanding and they've um, ticked some of the boxes in the doing their cross-cultural awareness training and that sort of stuff. I mean, those who live in the area, those mainstream service providers that are out here in the east, they'd be pretty au okay fait with the historic, the, you know, nature of um, out here in the burbs, you know, in Hillsville and Corrindoon. So, it, it, but but again, you know, that's you're building rapport and trust and, and it starts from there because you only need one that will say this service is really fantastic and, I, you know, you, you're getting them to say, I highly recommend um, to, to use utilising that that service. Maybe that's the most powerful tip, isn't it, that um, if you deliver great inclusive services, that is your very best marketing for evermore um, because word on the street is much more powerful than anything that we as providers could ever tell people. Having, you know, a real person from your community say, oh, this went really well for me, um, is a, a better endorsement than, you know, any of us could um, provide, even with billions of dollars of budget, I would suggest. Absolutely. Cool. Um, having people in your community say, oh, no, that was terrible, they, you know, didn't treat me well or they didn't know anything about me or our, our community or our mob or you know, whatever it might be, that's also a really powerful and often long-lasting message, isn't it? Yeah, and I think from what we've over our over the years, um, that we invite those specialised services to come and have a yarn with my group, you know, in the setting in a you know simple little um, you know a presentation style, and and they get to listen in and and learn about the likes of these types of service providers that are floating around. So, you know, again, it's it's the it's the way in which as the, you as coordinators or the role that you play within your org, um, that that's the way that you build some momentum and some and an understanding and some rapport between you you two creating a partnership. Just even coming along to events at local gathering places and things. So it might not even be an opportunity to do a formal um, presentation, but being able to meet some people and make connections in an informal environment or, you know, yeah. attending those um, events that you guys are coordinating can actually really be a great pathway into building those links. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, because we are always putting on um, super events here at Mullum, <laughs> gala dinners, gala dinners, NADOC balls, um, you know, uh, catering, um, Christmases, um, heaps of stuff. So, you know, it's the place to be. 
Excellent. So if you are in Melbourne's East, absolutely um, find out what the team at Mullum Mullum are doing because the food does sound fabulous. Um, but more broadly um, in other areas, I think um, just make sure that you are linked in and learning about those um, celebrations and events that are happening in your local community. Um, regardless of whether you are doing a formal presentation or formally involved in some way or just attending, it's a really good pathway in um, as a starting point. Thank you, Catherine, for mentioning that cultural load um, of the organisation and the expectation of those who need Mullum's input. We're talking of about some burnout. It, there's a there's a shared approach to it, and 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 as you can imagine, that cultural load can sometimes mean that it's heavily weighed um, on on Mullum. I'm really glad that's come up too. I think um, when I was talking about that idea of looking for reciprocal benefits before, I think that builds really nicely from there but understanding um that cultural load on an on a small organization in your local community is really important on the individual workers within those organizations is really important um but I also think there can be a bit of a cultural load not a bit of it there can be a significant risk um around cultural load on having champions within your organization as well the idea of if you have an um aboriginal worker whether that's part of their role or whether that's just their identity in any role in your organization that that person's is suddenly responsible for being um, the leader and knower of all things cultural in an organisation and responsible for the delivery of culturally safe services across a whole organisation and the education of all other workers and all of those things. While I'm sure that's not organisation's intention, I think that cultural load is real and can be quite oppressive for some people. So the idea of champions can be great, um, but the responsibility of delivering does not sit with champions and does not sit with our ACOs individually to be responsible for everybody else's learning and doing. And the other thing I think from that is it's the same for our clients. It is not the responsibility of an Aboriginal woman that you're working with to be responsible for educating you about all Aboriginal women's experience or needs or cultural identity or any of those things. So there's can be a bit of a fine line sometimes between we really want to understand people's story and what's important to them, but we don't want to ask older people to become responsible for what, you know, we need to take responsibility for doing our homework and coming in prepared to that conversation. You know, what, does that seem fair? Absolutely. I think we're getting better at it. The service providers that we roll around and rub shoulders with, they're getting better. So, you know, um it's just a it's it's a it's a work in progress. And also too, the, those champions can sometimes move on. So when we lose that, we nearly got to start again. So, you know, it's everybody's role within in your organizations, your mainstream service providers that, you know, you sort of keep that momentum going. We've really um, touched on some very big concepts and just the tip of the iceberg, but um, I hope that today has been an opportunity to think a bit about where you're up to, what might be important, um, and where specialisation verification might fit in for you um, and some things to be working towards in terms of delivering really culturally safe services for your communities. If you weren't aware, this is our last of um, eight sessions. So the videos are now available online. So you can go back and catch up on any of those and that might um, prompt some more conversation in your team as well. So good luck with the next steps. Thank you for being here today. Mm -hmm.